Okay. All right. So with that, we are very excited today to present our speaker, Dr. Jason Grabowski. He is with the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources. He is also our extension specialist in urban forestry. Uh, he has been doing all kinds of things. His uh, research interests include urban tree management, managing stormwater for urban sustainability using trees, and root pavement conflicts, which is very important in our highly densely populated state of New Jersey. Uh, and Jason has been with Rutgers for a while, and we are very lucky to, to have him here. He's very knowledgeable, and I'm sure you guys will all have lots of questions about trees, um, but we wanted to schedule this talk this week because Arbor Day is this week, so I hope you guys will have lots of questions uh, for Jason, and, and let's get this going. So go ahead, Jason. Okay, howdy, folks. Um, Amy and I were talking about questions. Um, we're just going to define a couple of terms. I look at questions as making what I'm talking about yours. So please feel free to post your questions um, and Amy will be breaking in as she can. Uh, there's two kinds of questions in my book. There are rabbit questions and there are squirrel questions. Squirrel questions are those questions where I channel my inner labrador retriever, squirrel, grab the squirrel, come back. We answer the question, we're done. A rabbit question, if you've ever hunted rabbit, rabbit questions take a little longer. The rabbit runs by, your dog starts chasing the pond, and they go around the pond. And while the dog is chasing the rabbit, you calmly load your gun, maybe have a little lunch. Pretty soon the dog starts chasing the rabbit back toward you. You might have a cigarette if you're so inclined to smoke. Comes around, you shoot the rabbit and then you got your answer. Okay, it takes a while. If we have a good rabbit question, I may just say that's a great rabbit question. Let's pick it up in about five minutes so that we can get some of the background stuff in there. Otherwise, if it's a really good question, I will abandon the talk and we'll have a conversation. So there are rabbit questions and there will be squirrel questions. Tonight we're talking about trees. Um, you know, that's a pretty broad topic. So I'll be giving you some information. Um, there are a lot of trees in New Jersey. When we look at the New Jersey forests documentation uh, through forest inventory analysis, which is a process that the USDA Forest Service produces on a perennial basis, um, it's very easy to find 75 to 80 species um, in the common listings in their inventory plots. And quite honestly, we could go over 150 species of trees in New Jersey very quickly. Um, ask any of the students in the dendrology class, by the time we get over 120 species, they want their heads to explode and I'm just starting to have fun. If we start looking at trees that are in our gardens and our cultivated varieties, we can even insert 50, 75 more species on top of that component. So there are a lot of trees to choose from. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. And you're going to see on parts of the slides, I'm pointing out a few trees that I think are kind of fun and where I have some eye candy. And of course, on this slide, we have bitternut hickory, which is a really neat tree. It's a fairly fast grower. The neat thing about this tree is while it does have a good hickory nut that animals like, people don't like it too much. It is a bitter nut hickory named appropriately, but it has a mustard yellow terminal bud and mustard yellow lateral buds, which are really kind of cool. And it's a 70, 80 foot tree um, and it takes um, a moist, well-drained soil. A uh, really cool tree if you get a chance to, to look at one. Uh, you'll find a lot of them up in the northern part of the state. Okay, let's see here. I'm raining. Let's try that. There we go. Now, with all those different trees, we probably have to, instead of saying, here are all the trees, memorize them all, and then choose something, maybe we ought to look a little bit differently at it and say, okay, why are we using trees? Why are we discussing trees? And by, by narrowing the debate, we can narrow the field of trees we really want to talk about. 
Um, trees can be used as an anchoring element within a landscape or an announcement in a landscape. We can use trees as the bones of large landscape programming so that we can guide people. Uh, we use them on golf courses for very much the same effect. In this case, we've got a design where we're using trees. They're anchoring the landscape in a very specific way. They're providing shade and organization to a parking lot and that parking lot's designed so that all the storm water captured on the parking lot will go up through the canopy of the tree. So it's a zero runoff parking lot. So we can use trees for engineering purposes if we can get the tree to the size that we need to provide some of those services. We can use trees to define spaces and to separate spaces. In the lower left, you can see here's a boulevard. This is New York City, but you can kind of close your eyes and, and kind of ignore the fact that you have New York City on either side of the street and you have a canopy boulevard and it gives you something a little bit different in a visual to look at. Trees are very important in our outdoor rooms. Instead of the rug, it's really building the ceiling element and the wall elements of an outdoor room. I hope you appreciate the Big Lebowski reference. I can't see your faces, nor can I hear you laughing hysterically. Um, but, but I hope that you appreciate some of the sight gags that may appear in the, in the presentation. Okay. Trees also provide a sense of scale. And so one of the things that we think about when we look at trees in a design sense is how big of a tree for the type of a site and how do we scale it against our structures. Here we have a sycamore, which is a great tree against a three to four story building, but it would absolutely overwhelm a, a, single, a single story uh, or a split level. Uh, sycamores are great on wet sites. Uh, they're a riverine type of a species. They come in very early. They can get 80 to 90 feet. Their leaves are as big as your face. So it's got a really big texture to it. And it has this marvelous white bark. As a sense of scale, you can drive down highways from Louisiana all the way up through New York State. And along stream courses, you can see these gigantic, graceful white trunked trees that really produce a, a, a sense of the landscape. And so when we think about trees, we're really talking more often than not about really tall trees as well. This is a persimmon. Persimmons are going to be a moderately sized tree, 40 feet probably. Uh, they provide food. How, uh, of course, I can't see your hands to your faces here, but uh, persimmons are really good to eat off the ground. Uh, they're very tasty. Um, and we can use that to our advantage in a landscape when we're looking at providing habitats. In a garden space, we might choose away from that because with all that fruit falling on the ground and rotting, you may find that really unappealing. Although I'll tell you that your possums will really enjoy that. In garden spaces, we tend, and in our, our organized landscapes, we tend to think of those as synthetic communities of plants. And when we have that, we may choose something like the common persimmon because it has an incredibly beautiful bark. And it's relatively adaptive to, to soils that may be slightly compromised. But more often than not, we're going to go beyond the species to what's called a cultivated variety that's chosen for some kind of an aesthetic purpose, or maybe it's chosen for an environmental tolerance. A cultivated variety such as Green Mountain Sugar Maple has a slightly thicker leaf with a waxier cuticle so that in the wind, the leaves don't tatter. And we select for that kind of stuff in our formal landscapes, in our design landscapes. But if we're in a natural landscape or if we're trying to do something uh, on a larger property where we're trying to be a steward of the landscape, we would probably move away from cultivars and what we want our seed, a sense of the genetic diversity and maybe select those stocks to meet the environmental niche that's on that land. And so we're going to celebrate the variability rather than the consistency when we go into a more natural space. Now, 
That's different than talking about native species. And here's a, a really nice New Jersey native. This is Magnolia cuminata, the cucumber tree. It's one of the tallest of the magnolias. This can get to be 70 feet or higher without too much trouble. Nice, dense pyramidal design. The leaves are huge. The flowers are gorgeous, but the fruits kind of look like uh, animal scat falling on the lawn. So don't, don't go for the fruit on this one, but the flowers can be quite nice. Um, it is native to parts of New Jersey. It's not native to all of New Jersey. If we're going to think about your property as the geographic location for nativeness. Now, if you expand that and we talk about New Jersey or we talk about the mid-Atlantic region, well, then nativeness can start taking on a, a bit of a shifting look, depending how rigorous we want to be in defining the geometry of the native range. And so that's something to consider. You know, here is a native to the riverine areas of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Okay, this is Catalpa speciosa. It is very common in New Jersey now because it's naturalized. This one takes fairly wet sites, has a, a very large leaf. The leaf is probably about this big, uh, just about the size of your face. Um, really cool tree, can get to be about 80 foot tall. I just love this tree because it never looks like a really good canopy. I mean, only, only a mother could love a canopy shaped like this. Uh, very coarse textured. The branches tend to be a bit brittle. And so the canopy breaks apart a little bit. But in a natural landscape, that can be really handy for a lot of other organisms. This tree, once it hits the ground, it tends to stay on the ground for a while. It doesn't tend to degrade very quickly. And that's why we used to grow catalpa and harvest catalpa to make railroad ties. Now here we have one next to a lake. This is upstate New York. The tree on the right is a catalpa, um, very thick, straight, bold tree. And again, the canopy just looks kind of weird, but the flowers are gorgeous. And so here you've got the flowers. They come up in a panicle, um, lots and lots of these flowers. Um, I think it's an absolutely gorgeous tree with, with a really blocky texture. So from a distance, this is a really striking tree. They have these, some people call them hanging snakes. You have these very long pods with, with these paired seed akines um, inside the pod and they fly away. So once this stay around and it can become a bit of a nuisance, but I've noticed that my lawnmower can chew through any young catalpa as long as it's less than say two, three feet tall. There's two different species of catalpa that grow in the New Jersey landscapes, catalpa speciosa above, catalpa bignanoides on the lower. That's the northern catalpa on the top, the southern catalpa on the bottom. It's really hard to tell these apart um, when they're young because catalpa bignanoides is going to ma mature at about 35, 40 feet. So if you get a catalpa that's 75, 80 feet, you know you got a northern catalpa. But when they're young, it's hard to tell apart. Uh, the way I tell them apart is by these seeds and the differences in the seeds, which mean, isn't that cool that you gotta get that far in. Um, also, the way the branching looks, you can make a, a distinction. However, if you get a, catal a northern catalpa that's just in a really lousy site, it's gonna look a heck of a lot like a southern catalpa. So it, it's almost like trying to follow baseball players in the modern trade system, they're changing their laundry faster than you can tell who's who. In this case, go with the seeds and you can tell one from the other. And also the Northern Catalpa, when you crush the leaves and you smell it, it smells kind of like green stuff. Okay, just nothing major. However, if you take the Southern Catalpa and you crush the leaf and you smell it, it will knock a buzzard off a gut cart. I mean, it is nasty. It's, it's the anchor to a dendrology lecture that I give that everything has a stink. It, it's a great plant to do that. You will always remember it after one sniff. Um, and if, if you're sensitive to such things, don't do it. Just look at the seeds. 
but it points out something particularly for those people who are in a developed landscape or in a developed housing subdivision or in, in a city. There are no tree species that are native to a post-industrial age landscape. And so we probably ought to be thinking what was previously indigenous to our area. And instead of worrying about the players, worry about the laundry to con continue that baseball theme here. It's more about the jerseys than it is about who's wearing the jerseys. And I, I encourage you tonight, define your site and then define your function and choose the plants that fit the environmental niche to provide your function. Because there is nothing native to an urban environment. And the urban environment indeed has changed enough that some things that used to live here may not be so appropriate. So define the site. That's the first thing you wanna do. Define your function, and that can, that's really big, and we're going to play with that, that for a while. Once you've defined the site and you've defined the functions, then you got to do your homework. Now, we'll go through some sources where you can find free downloads and figure out how to do your homework. Don't, don't go to a nursery and say, I've got this spot, and I'm kind of looking for this. To get whatever is overstocked, or whatever is going to maximize profit margin, unless you get a plants, a plants person in business rather than a business person in plants. So I'm not going to cast aspersions over an industry here, but an educated consumer can usually have a better conversation with the highest level of professional. And if they're not dealing with the highest level of professional, they can still get what they want, but it's up to you to do your homework. Once you do that, you create a list. From that list, you develop a choice, and then you can start, you can start talking here. Here's Rubinia pseudoacacia, the black locust. It's interesting, particularly in this natives kind of talk, because based on the range maps for the species in the 1970s, we call them the little range maps, it is not native to New Jersey. However, if you go back into the 1930s, when Munns did his atlas of tree species in the United States, his botanic maps, black locust is native to the very western edge of New Jersey, running from just about I-78, clipping through Princeton, cutting out a little bit below Trenton. It's also the exact same clip of a range where black maple, not sugar maple, but black maple, that also is native to New Jersey. So it depends on what book you look at sometimes. This is Rubinia pseudoacacia. These are some nice 60 foot tall trees. Um, I think that, that they're fantastic because there's, their flowers are so darn smelly. I can drive by this property at 75, 80 miles an hour and still perfume my car as I drive by, which I think is a pretty stellar accomplishment. Um, not my driving, but the fact that it, it has such a pleasant smell. So you develop your choices. And once you develop your choices, you may want to think about what is the function if it's an ecological function. One of the things you may have to do is plant many of this critical population, not only for its own longevity, but also if it's, it's meant as a food source. So that's something to consider. So what's the best species for you to plant in your yard? Well, the first thing you do is you define your site. Well, moisture and light and wind. Then, well, how big of a tree do I want? Am I worried about screening a view or something? How big should the tree get? That's part of defining function. Once you know that, you can size the, the kind of tree. And that sizing really narrows the range of all of, the, all of these trees that we have available to us. But remember, when you see something, particularly in a nursery catalog, they're going to give you a size, they're going to give you a hardiness zone. That's based on the best case scenarios. If you've got a damaged to poor site, they're not going to get that big. They'll, they'll get there, but they're not going to get that big. 
there's always a range in how big something can get. Tulip poplar, tulip tree, a Liriodendron tulipifera. It has a mature size of 120 feet in the Delaware water gap. It has a mature size of 80 feet in Atlanta, Georgia, going down into Florida because lightning hits them so often down there. They never get much bigger than 80, 90 feet. Although there is one outside of Orlando that's 112 feet tall. So they have the potential, but they get blown out. So what we wanna do is think about our functions. When we think about our planting process, this is an old slide that comes from Nina Bassett when I was working at Cornell with her. Um, we do a site assessment. From the site assessment, then we select our plant species. If we don't have an acceptable plant species or we know what we want, but the site doesn't handle it, then we have to modify the site. And that, that's, a, that's a, a feedback loop, if you will. My considered opinion for all of you folks, it is easier to change your opinion of what you want as a plant than to try to bend the will of your environment to support a plant that you've fallen in love with. So I, I would really take it seriously, try to define your site and then choose those things that naturally work in that environment. You'll spend less money in maintenance and you'll lower the intensity of any disease in the area. And so if you want to assess your site, you probably need some guidance. Uh, we're going to talk about these in a couple of moments, but Cornell Urban Trees, which we'll see in a moment, as well as the Northern Trees website, both have downloadable site assessment checklists that can help you in this process. As you're doing this, I always keep things in the back of my mind. I'm sure you do the same. You know, when I'm thinking about selecting for sites, I'm wondering about road salts. Uh, salt spray, salt deposits, and how that impacts the fitness of a plant for that landscape. Oh, did I make that drawing on that? Huh, I apologize. No, looks like someone else did that. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Yep, I see that we have a, a few, few typos. Uh, never has a dyslexic to spell. Um, in any case, Elevated heat from reflected surfaces of your buildings or from the roof of your car, heat drives water use. And so, you know, I'm always, I tend to almost overcompensate thinking about water. Because if you understand water, if you control water, you control the success or failure of your landscape. So I'm always thinking, I, I tend to go from soils to plants, as goes the soil, so goes your plant community. As goes your plant community, so goes your animal community. And if you understand the water in the situation, that determines the success or failure of your landscape. So I tend to spend a lot of time on water and a lot of time on soil. And if you're in a developed landscape, almost all of the time, the soil has been compacted from construction. And so you have to prove to me that the soil's in good shape. I'm going to assume it's in bad shape and that I'm going to have to loosen that soil up. And the best tool for that is a hand spade and some time. Also some teenage kids that are easily bribed, that would also help. Um, when I think about soils and when I think about the soil to the plant relationship, you take care of soil physics. That's the water and the drainage. You respect the chemistry, and that's called pH more often than not, the acidity or alkalinity of your system. If you take care of the physics and you respect the chemistry, the biology will always follow because biology is subject to physical and chemical law. So take care of the soil, understand that soil and water, you'll be okay. Once you start defining the site, then we want to start thinking about the future. And one of the things that is probably the most useful right now 
is looking at what disease pest problems you have right now and what's coming toward you. Beech leaf disease is something that we know is coming. It's technically in New Jersey. We really don't know what to do about it. I probably wouldn't be planting any beech anytime soon until I know that I can manage my investment if I'm investing in that species of tree. Not only are beech rather expensive and rather difficult to transplant, but now they got yet another problem from beech bark disease to beech leaf disease. So I might kind of hold off on beech for a while. Uh, bacterial leaf scorch on the red oak group could be a problem. It's even on white oak group. This is Quercus bicolor, the swamp white oak. Wetter site, it will tolerate a slightly drier site. It's a beautiful dense canopy tree. The acorns are very ornate and you know they're, they're, they're beautiful acorns. Um, and also the leaves, very glossy on the top, dark green glossy. On the bottom side, you have some pubescence and it's a very light color. So when the leaves move in the wind, you get a bicolor leaf, um, hence Quercus bicolor. Most of your oaks are going to be seedling stocks. That's because it's really hard to propagate oaks asexually from cuttings and other things. Cultivated variety selections are reproduced as genetic clones and they're either grown out or they're spliced onto a seedling type rootstock because they have some kind of a look or some kind of an advantage in the marketplace. And so if I'm in a if I'm in a, a very highly maintained landscape, I may look at cultivars, but if I want oaks, just go seedling and stock. You'll be a lot happier for it, but you'll have a lot more variability in what you plant. Okay, so if you define the site, now we have to define some functions and then we do some homework. We create a list and then develop our choices. Now then, once you have your list and you have a choice, one thing we want to think about is something called diversity. Um, looking at it, if your neighbor has it, don't plant it, enjoy theirs. Plant something else. And that can work, but you risk becoming what I call dysfunctional tree zoo. Um, particularly, um, it, it's not just about having a lot of different things, but you have to have functional populations of a lot of different things. And so while I like the, if your neighbor has it, choose something else, um, that will drive diversification, but it might not drive function the way you want it to. So you so kind of temper that, but we're always looking to build more diversity in our landscape. That doesn't mean we want a worldwide homogenous plant community but it, it means that, that we should be thoughtful about what we choose and where we put it. This is Taxodia disticum, the bald cypress. Uh, this is a very flood tolerant plant. Notice I keep talking about flood tolerant plants and also plants that seem to do well south of here. As our temperatures keep warming up and we get slightly wetter, we do know that there are a lot of our riparian areas that will look like a southeast bottomland forest as far as soil type, water regime, temperature regime. Uh, these are trees that do quite well and function as an ecosystem, as a community quite well. So there's a little bit of a theme in the background. Uh, this is a really large tree. It is a deciduous conifer. It's an awesome looking tree, um, 70, 80 feet without a problem grows faster than the scalded dog runs when it's young, and then it just kind of slows down and winds down. It's quite a nice tree. Getting to that diversity, um, we need to be a little bit careful in that. Um, first thing is, we, we tend to look at diversity as counting things and saying, well, I, I have a very diverse population. I have X number of species. And that, that's cool, that's groovy. Um, but it, it's also about the evenness of that population and the functionality that it's not just one of everything, it, it's functional populations of each group. Um, the, 
the other thing that I want to point out is we have a lot of different types of sites. And so I would think in my landscape of my good sites and then my really poor sites or challenged sites, my wet sites and my dry sites. And while there's some trees that can occupy all of those, what I want to do is start parsing out my populations so that where I have really limited sites, I use the durable plants. Where I have really benign and happy sites, I try to mix it up a little bit more. Now, if there's anybody that's in the nursery industry, one of the things that, that could be done is to build your stock portfolios so that you can enable a clientele to choose my wet site plants or my dry site plants or my well-drained site plants. And, and, and that way packaging your inventory. If you're not in the nursery, organize your sites, organize the kinds of sites you have and you can do the same thing. And then you know what to ask for without having to define everything from scratch. Hey, Jason, excuse yeah. me. I've got some questions. Do you want to take them now or yeah. want to wait? Definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, so, so we have the, the dreaded ash tree question. Yes. Um, uh, someone says they've lost a lot of ash trees and would like to plant something in its place, but many of the sites are surrounded by other trees, so any new planting would be shaded. Will you be able to provide suggestions on how to deal with this? Yeah, to, you know, the cheap advice is if you've already got working shade, let that shade infill. Don't plant anything. If you are going to plant something because you need to fill that space, plant something that's adapted as an understory species. Like, you know, we have redbud in this state, we have some dogwood in this state. There are a lot of small trees that are adapted for lower light environments. I would choose those. We even have trees like service barrier or amelanchier that are really good as understory plants on the edge because they need more light, but they space fill on the edge of the forest like sassafras will do that too. So we, we have that stuff. You don't have to replace it. If there's enough shade already, let the stuff that's residual infill. You know, and, and then work, work your design around that. Okay, thank you. Now here's another generic question. So if a specific tree had to be removed because it had a parasite or something wrong with it, is no. it okay to replace with the same species of tree? Well, it's really good for the parasite, but it's not going to be great for your management. So the, the, cheap, the, the cheapest advice, do something different. But first you have to understand the parasite and figure out what it does. Because let's say that it's a parasite that only eats hot dog Johnny's hot dogs, uh, white oak trees, and the occasional catalpa. Um, a, don't leave your hot dogs laying around and don't plant a catalpa if a white oak died from that disease. So you got to know the disease to know what to avoid. Um, but yeah, you're, you're asking for trouble to put the same thing back. So, so just don't do that. Okay, thank you. Then there was a question, if a native is grafted onto a non-native is it considered native or non-native? It depends who you want to argue with. Um, the, I find the whole nativeness question rather silly. I think that we have indigenous species that produce viable ecological services. But if those niches change, nativeness means very little at that point. And particularly in a developed landscape, where environmental pressures are accentuated or exaggerated, there may be a lot of stuff that is quote native, but it's just not ecologically fit for that new environment. Um, if I graft a 
native onto a non-native rootstock? I'm going to say it's not native because we didn't have those scissors and grafting paste in the natural environment. I'm not sure that's the right question to be asking, to be honest. I mean, it, it, it's, a neat, it's a neat conversation to have, but I would really hate to have to arbitrate that on a contract because most of our grafting happens in Oregon because that's where we have the climate to maximize our reliability and propagation. And then they move all that stuff back to the East Coast and grow it out on the East Coast. Unless you got really good paperwork and stuff, my head would explode. So I just, I'm not sure it's the right question. Okay. Uh, some of the other questions are fairly specific. So I'm gonna let you keep going to get okay. through your material. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, you know, diversity is where you find it. I, I'm reminded of people saying, well, monocultures are bad. And indeed, it, they can be very bad. I'm not going to say that they're good. However, it depends on the scale of the landscape that you're managing. The World Trade Center reflecting absence works because it's meant to be a cathedral feel in a monoculture for a continuity of structure. So on that plot, it's a monoculture, but in lower Manhattan, it did not even change the needle as a percentage of that species in the entire lower Manhattan tree inventory. So we want to be careful when we think about diversity, it's on a scale and the scale I, can, I, I like using is, where's your municipality? Do a full municipal unit and, and work towards diversity in your community, not on your property. And then on your property, you might be able to build a functional component with enough of the same species of tree to provide some type of a habitat. I don't know, I mean, it depends on your species and many things. But diversity for diversity's sake ignores the fact that it scales. And on a community level, we look at 10% of your community should be in one species maximum. We'd rather it be five, 20% within a genus and 30% within a plant family. And a lot of this has to do as an artificial diversity, it, does, it bears no resemblance to an ecological, naturally occurring forest community. But what it does do is it structures how we choose things so that the next yeasty beastie that comes in doesn't take out 80% of our canopy. So that's something that we wanna think about. So we always try to structure something, people like numbers. And so we call the 10, 20, 30 rule, a way of looking at entire municipalities. Beyond that, we may wanna think about stratifying ages. So if I have a lot of really old ocus what the heck is, maybe I need to start planting some new ones. So as the old ones phase out, I don't lose that species in my portfolio. Think of it like your, your retirement portfolio. You've got to stratify it in a couple of different ways in order for it to work. On the right-hand side, you can see this is a really nice European beach hedge. And I will point out, if you look in the center of the picture, and for whatever reason, I can't get my mouse to jump over, you will notice the car in the middle of the photograph. These are really large hedges. These are 70 foot tall hedges. And they're all one species. This is European beach, next to European beach. If beach leaf disease gets over to Malmo, Sweden, they're going to be in a world of hurt. And so, you know, you look at this, entire parks are laid out, the bones of the park are laid out with these gigantic, gigantic hedges. And why do we keep planting them here? Because if you buy the equipment to do this, you keep doing it because you spend a lot of money on the equipment. And it is iconic. It's not really sustainable. And management-wise, this is a real heartache, especially if you get a disease that starts taking out these trees. What happens if European beach gets hit with beech leaf disease in Malmo, Sweden? 
they'll cut all the trees down, they'll chip up the wood, and they'll use all those beach chips to smoke hams and boar's head bologna. That's about all you can do with it. So no more than 10% of an urban forest or an urban community should be in any one genus. And that gets to be even more important when we think about some of our widely ranged tree species. Trees are, we have so many tree species and some of them have relatives and some of them don't. Here are where elm species occur across the, the globe. And notice that we have them in Europe, we have them um, it, you know, cutting right across, jumping over into Asia, and we've got some in North America. So if we get an insect, it's going to start grooving its digestive capacity on this genus. And if we move something from China to the US, or if we move something from Europe to the US in elm, it's going to start eating that because it already has the digestive capacity to do so. Look at ash trees. The emerald ash borer from China has decimated what we have in North America. Cool, really, really cool point here. The number one cause of tree death in the Olympic village in Beijing is emerald ash borer because all of the ash trees for the Beijing Olympics came from Michigan. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? So, you know, we move stuff around, but when we think about the species that we're choosing, we may want to think about that. Maple trees, maple trees are all over the place. So there's all sorts of stuff that's able to attack and eat and use maple as a host. Oaks are just as bad. Of course, oaks are so broad and diverse, we can get away with a lot with oak that we can't in some of these other genres. And then there's something like coffee tree. Look at coffee tree. You can see there's a little bit in China, a little bit over in India area. And then there's this little pocket in the US, Kentucky coffee tree, really cool tree. We could actually go up above that 10% number slightly because there's very few things that eat Kentucky coffee tree simply because once they eat those, they run out of food. Here's the, na the native ranges in 1977, Little is down below, 1938, Mons is up above. You can see that they're not necessarily native to New Jersey in the maps, but they do grow in New Jersey quite well. You can see some trees on the side there. These are Kentucky coffee trees in upstate New York where, where I grew up. Um, they're 65, 70 foot tall, absolutely gorgeous plant. Um, they look really awkward when they're young. They look like a teenage boy. They're just all gangly. They don't know what to do. Um, and and they, they're really awkward, um, at least for about 15 years. And then they start putting on some nice canopy. They've got a great bark. They're very adaptable to your wetter, heavier soils. Um, I can't say enough good things about it. It's a beautiful wood. And it used to be when we had this wood, when if you, if you were expecting a child, you would plant some of this Kentucky coffee tree. If it was a girl, by the time the girl was getting married, you could mill the wood and build a hope chest out of it. This wood is absolutely gorgeous. Um, Excuse me, Jason. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know you have 15 minutes. That sounds good because we're only halfway through. <laughs> so there's the bean of the Kentucky coffee tree. Isn't it a beautiful thing? So, how do you look at diversity in your community? Check with an environmental steward or your local shade tree commission, figure out what's growing in your, in your community. Does your community have a tree inventory that could guide your choice for diversity? If they don't, maybe you need to help your tree commission. Maybe you need to help your environmental stewards. Maybe we can work as a community to help our other community members. My backyard, just to show you how I live. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of information. Where do I find stuff? There are a lot of different places to look. And since this is recorded, you can hit still on the photograph and you can see all these titles. I'm just going to point out that uh, this European linden in this cemetery, it's just, they're, they're all grafted together. That's one continuous organism at this point, which I think is just cool. It goes for about a quarter mile. Absolutely cool what you can do with horticulture. Type in Silvix or, or Silvix online. 
and you can come up to this document. It's called Silvix of North America. And when you click on Silvix of North America, you can click on conifers or you can click on hardwoods. When you click on those, you get an organized set of PDFs where you can look up any species of native and some non-native species of trees in the United States. You click on this one, it happens to be American hornbeam. It gives you the native range. It gives you information about what trees does it grow with. It tells you about the soils that it needs. It tells you about the temperature regimes it needs. Beautiful tool, it's free. Fire Effects Information Service. This is a little bit more sideways, but this is a great website. Gives you much the same information. It gives you the natural history of the plant. When I say do your homework, go to these sites, try to find the trees that you're looking at by species. In this one, you, go, you can type in a species, you type in the species or you can type in a life form. And it just, in about 15 minutes, you can guide your way down to a really neat list. And here we have pitch pine and it tells you about pitch pine, not just about how it deals with fire, which is really useful in much of our state, but it also gives you, again, a lot of that life history. These are US Forest Service documents that the citations go back to the 1880s in many cases. We've been thinking about this a long time. It gives you the background so you understand your inventory so you can see how your tree species links to your site. So I said, you assess your site and then you define the function. Go uh, Cornell, I hate to say Cornell, went to Cornell, I, I worked on this. Urban Horticulture Institute, recommended urban trees. This is a really great website. You can download all of this and I'll point, point it down to number three in the appendices. There's a site assessment checklist and a site assessment guide that can help you read your site. Really useful information. And also it organizes small trees, medium trees, and to large trees in environmental gradients like salt tolerance, pH, soil, water. So it helps you organize things to figure out trees that you may or may not want. It's really kind of neat. You can download the entire publication. Um, I like free. It gives you a lot of information, not only about the species. On this page, this is green ash, which of course we're not planting anymore, but it also gives you all the different cultivated varieties that are popular on the market. This is the one that Rutgers was involved with. This is Northern Trees. This, this is a little bit old, but still quite functional. You can choose by species name, or you can go through, there's a site analysis process, and there's also documentation within the urban design to help you go through your own site analysis. And once you do the site analysis and you know what you want, you can go into this website and you go into the selection mode. And on the upper left, it's your hardiness zone. And then we have the different, whether it's native or not, on the upper right, lower left, we're looking at the form of the tree as far as thorns, bark, and trunk. And then on the lower right, how big does it get? How wide does it get? What is its texture? What is the canopy density? And, and what shape is it? So it'll take you about an hour to get used to the site, but uh, it gives you a lot of information for free. You can buy the street tree fact sheets. This is a great visual database that once you learn the database about 35, 40 minutes, this is a very useful document with a lot of very nice color photographs. There's one for planting trees underneath power lines as well as your regular street trees. I think that that's a really useful tool. And now they've combined the two. So for $30, you can go to Penn State and get all of these for $30 as a PDF probably the, the best, most efficient way to go about it. Um, if you like visual databases to organize your information, this one works out really well. The DER manual for woody landscape plants, this is under $100. Um, it gives you all the cultivated varieties. If I'm doing garden design, I'm probably looking at this book. If I'm doing forest work or natural areas, I'm using Haichu, particularly the white book on the upper right. Uh, native tree shrubs and vines for rural America. While it's limited to just what we consider native, it's a fantastic document. 
where it gives you all of the information you need, like you get in Silvix online, like you get in the fire intensity index. Uh, this book is about $160, but whenever I've got a serious question, this is the book I tend to go to. Hey, Jason, I'm going to start the poll because we are running out of time. Yep. So everybody, I am going to launch this poll. Make sure that you hit yes to the consent if you would like to participate, and then make sure that you hit submit when you are finished so that we actually record your answer uh, rather than, you know, if you fill it out and don't hit submit, then we don't get your numbers. So please take a look. And uh, we do have some questions. So I don't know if now is a good time, Jason, or if you want to get through and we'll yeah, take no, questions at the end. Let's go, go to, to this page here. What's the question? Okay. Uh, so someone asked if all tree of heaven trees should be removed because of the spotted lanternfly issue. Oh, I would like that. I think a lot of people would like that. Um, one of the things we're noticing, though, is that um, there's we're actually we actually were scouting today for opportunities. Um, it's very likely that when Tree of Heaven is gone, they will find something else. Um, and right now, we're wondering if that something else may be black walnut. So, um, yeah, get rid of the Atlant Atlantis. There, there, we've got so many other things that actually are so much more useful and functional. I just assume we get rid of them. And this is a great excuse, um, but that's not going to make this problem go away. Um, it may tamp it down. Not going to make it go away. All right. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so. So someone says that they have holly trees in their backyard and they seem to keep growing from suckers and are taking over. Are there any suggestions for control? Um, Christmas and, and <laughs> selling it for profit and just harvest it to the point where it gives up. Um, okay, so just prune it to death? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's that's what I've done. Um, I'm sure that there's probably a more sophisticated answer, but pragmatically, um, you get it down once and a lawnmower is a beautiful thing. <laughs> okay, and uh, do you have any recommendations for companion trees for holly? No, that, that's no. striking me from left field. I don't have a good answer. Okay, and then uh, there's... There's a big movement uh, through Dr. Doug Tallamy's work uh, on native trees for native insects, for native birds. Uh, so, yeah. so how do you make sure that you are getting actually truly native trees and not nativars or cultivars? There's a difference between intention and reality. We're going to scrap the talk, but um, well, um, because this is a really good rabbit question. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, the only way to do in a pure sense of what we're talking about is to forcibly recruit from our native stands as they stand today. And I see the acorn fall, I beat the squirrel to the acorn, I plant the acorn, I nurture the acorn, the acorn grows and lives to the point where it starts providing function. Um, the last I look, very few insects are that fussy as far as for habitat or for predation. Most birds are more mobile than that many animals are more mobile than that. And there's no demonstration to me that an oak tree from Delaware is any less functional than an oak tree from 10 miles away in Southern New Jersey, even though they're native to two different states. Um, because no insects or animals I know have Cortana um, you know, a lot of what we do with geography becomes rather artificial. 
Now, Doug makes a great point, and I don't want to minimize that point, but we have not demonstrated how high the fidelity is in many, many cases. And how do you know? The only way you know is if you do it yourself. And that's a really high bar. Um, and there's no actual evidence to my mind that what you plant today that has been relevant in your area where you're standing for the last 350 years, 400 years is going to be at all relevant 30 years from now because with climate change, so do niches and so do adaptive fitness. And I think that there's a larger question about fitness that goes with function that we have to consider because particularly with trees, you're planting on a 50 to 70 year promise. And a lot of stuff's gonna change between now and then. So if what we do is we, we focus on the function, not we're probably doing better than if we ignore things. To get that high fidelity that I can only use, let's say a red bud from two miles of where I'm at, markets just don't work that way. And while you can do that, you're going to have to do that. And it's a thoughtful, worthwhile thing to do, but I don't think that the evidence is on your side saying that if I don't do that, that I'm... Um, which is going to get me in trouble in some circles. And, you know, I, that, that's okay. Um, I think there's also a question of scale and of regionality when we make these statements, because managing on the individual plant basis gets to be really difficult. And we have to think about moving as a community, not as a bunch of individuals because then we can coordinate our actions to greater effect. So um, I am going to point out real quick, uh, we are out of time, but uh, Climate Change Atlas is a great place to go to look at what climate change scenarios and where our forest types are going. You'll notice that New Jersey changes, um, but only a little bit. Um, we're going to, the pines are going to be a little bit stronger where the pines are. Oak hickories are going to be really strong. The maples are going to start going away. The birch are going to start going away. And you can see each species and what happens. White oak doesn't do so well, but some of the Southern oaks are going to move in and be very good for us. Uh, Eastern white pine is a big loser. It's just, it's already losing. We're already seeing it because our summer temperatures are too warm. Uh, so tree atlas, please go take a look at that, play with that for an hour. It should be good. All right. I'm 10 minutes <laughs> off. Oh, well. Um, well, uh, are you willing to take a couple more questions or? Of course I am. Of course. Okay. Uh, so someone wants to know, is, is there any success in bringing back the American chestnut? Um, yes. In a word, yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, so it's only, you know, comparatively, it's been very fast. What we've been able to do through intensive breeding with a species that takes decades to go from seed to seed. Um, so we're getting there. It's not fast, but it'll come back. And I want it to come back because back in the day, you would take white oak acorns, mash them up, and you would take chestnuts mash it up, blend it up, roll it up in a leaf and cook it with a little bit of honey. And that used to be bread, a really high protein bread. Um, kind of got away from that, but boy, chestnuts are tasty. And you mix those with, with white oak acorns and a bit of honey. Oh my goodness, you got some really good food going. <laughs> um, real quickly, I'd like to make sure everyone takes part in the poll. And then I also wanted to let you know that this is the last of our series for the spring and we will be following up with you 
with a survey in your email to ask if you have implemented any of the actions that were given to you by our speakers, uh, not just for this webinar series, but for our last fall and the spring before. So please be on the lookout for that. But while I have Jason here, I'm gonna keep asking questions. Just wanted to put a plug out there. Uh, so I have a question. Is it foolish to think that we could plant hemlock again? No, we already have some hemlock that have been identified as largely resistant. Um, they're very young, so wait 120 years before you can get a 120-year tree out of it. Um, but uh, actually in New Jersey, uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Forestry Service, they're working on it. They've identified uh, some very promising lines. That's great. Um, so... <laughs> what is the best oak for northern New Jersey? A live one. <laughs> uh, yeah, quite, quite honestly, um, it's, a, it's an embarrassingly difficult question to answer. Uh, I, I still think that white oak are going to be appropriate, but maybe we're looking at some other white oak group trees. They're not going to vaporize and go away they're just not going to be as important because other things are going to outcompete in the forest in natural regeneration. That, okay. that they don't work in your landscape. So I'm still big on white oak, um, but you gotta like gypsy monk too, so. Right. Uh, could you get to your contact info slide, please? Just so that, because I think we're gonna lose people Yep. There are a lot of questions here, but some of them are very specific. Uh, so I want people to be able to contact you directly. Okay. Um, there we go. There we go. There, there's Jason in all of his glory. <laughs> yep. That's what um, soil with a Mach 2 air knife does. It blows soil <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> nice. Okay, so there is a question about replacing ash, what tree would you recommend as an ash replacement? Um, I can't answer that. Um, look, ash tree, ash were planted all over the place because they're easy to grow, they're fast growers, and they were cheap. So in landscapes, there is no rhyme or reason to why you had ash. So I would go back to the basics and define your site, define what you're trying to do with that ash tree and plant the appropriate species uh, because there's just too many options there. In a forest, an upland forest, um, you know, ash naturally dies out and gets replaced. It used to be with, um, uh, a maple birch beach assemblage in many places, um, that's not going to be wholly appropriate. So, you know, we're looking at gracefully moving to an oak hickory assemblage. So I would probably bias towards that kind of a community. Um, but again, that's useless if you're in a fairly wet site and you have green ash that are adapted to a wet site, you're all right. going to do so good. So you really have to define the site first before you can attempt that kind of an answer. Okay, then there's also a question, if a tree is cut down, could a sprout be nourished from the old woodstock, like the stump? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. um, not all species do that well, but we used to organize forestry up until say the late 1800s in low forestry versus high forestry. And low forestry is coppice growth where you cut things down and you take those sprouts and you regenerate the forest from that. We call that coppice growth now. Uh, we call it a couple different things. Um, yeah, perfectly legitimate. We've been doing it for about 10, 11 centuries. Works pretty good. Um, doesn't work for everything, but you can do that. Okay, uh, any thoughts on how or what to do with English ivy on black locust? Will it kill the tree? Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you get enough of it, it will, because that, that's what it does. It grows on things and it allows the thing to deal with, with the messy stuff like gravity and self-support and puts all of its growth into the water pipes without support. And if it overtops or if it suppresses light access for the rest of the canopy, it's gonna kill the tree. So the easiest thing to do in my mind is to go in there with a good set of pruners and cut all the vines and cut a strip, all the vines about one foot of what apart and just take an encircling strip, let it die, let it get dry, let it get brittle, and then start pulling it out. It's gonna look awfully ugly, but it'll be less damaging if you let it look ugly for a while. I mean, uh, I look ugly on a perennial basis. Once a week, I put a tie on and clean up uh, in <laughs> process. Uh, going from ugly to pretty is a process. If it takes 12, 15 years to get the problem, it's probably gonna take you one to two years to get out of it. Okay, any thoughts on getting rid of bamboo that's creeping onto a property? None that are legal. I, I, <laughs> You know, I'm reminded of gasoline in a darn good match, but I know that you can't legally say that. Um, it's going to be about eradication by just pulling it right out of the ground and establishing a deep barrier so that the stolons can't move across. Okay, well, I appreciate you staying on. There are lots of questions. Here is Steve's. I got nothing else to do. If, if, if folks want to ask questions, you know, this is your time. I talk too long. So ask your questions. It's my pleasure. Okay. Um, so, so here I have an unusual question and I'm not sure exactly what it means. So I will ask you, uh, are there any Native American trail marker trees in New Jersey? And what trees are good for making these trail marker trees? I know kind of what you're talking about, but I do not have any good information on that. Okay. Um, Imagine that if I was doing trail markers, I would be going for long-lived species that have a deep bark where once I make the mark, it stays, or a really thin barked tree where once I make it, it's just labeled, but they tend to fall apart too fast. So, except for maybe beach. Okay. Do you know anything about the pagoda dogwood and its history? Pagoda dogwood. Um, I would have to go back to, to some books to check, but for some reason I thought that that one, I think I've seen that it listed as uh, endemic to the North American continent, but I'm not positive. I would have to look it up. Um, you know, if I do this, you'll see I've got a lot of books uh, the, the, you know, I've got, um, I've, I've got a ridiculous number of books and that's because I suffer from male mental pause. I forget things and I look them up. Uh, I, I would have to look that one up. But if you want to email me, follow up on it, I will look it up and I'll get you some information on Pagoda Dog. Okay, now I have a question about arborvitae that has fallen over. Will it regrow if the main trunk is lying on the ground sideways? Yes. Really cool story. Way back when, when I had hair and I was a lot younger, um, had a line of arborvitae, shallow soil, very wet. They were all fairly mature arborvitae, about 40 of them, big windstorm. The entire set fell as a unit. We got four tow trucks, about uh, eight cables of elevator cable from, from high rise buildings. And we pulled the trees up and they went up and up and up, and bam! We got them to stand up, we cabled them in and they're still alive on my parents' property. Um, and I'm still here and that's about 45 years later. And they didn't even stop growing for a moment. Um, wow. when, 
when they tip over, as long as they've got a critical amount of roots still connected to the soil on the underside, they're going to keep going. They're going to look funky, but they're going to keep going. Okay. Uh, do you have any resources or recommendations to teach children about native trees? Yes, um, but teach about native trees is pretty broad. Um, I like almost the story time reading of Mary Teelgard Watts's reading of the American landscape because she has a great narrative voice and it's storytelling insinuating the trees into each of those native landscapes. And um, then she also inexpensive tree identification books. Um, she was a, one of the head research scientists of the Morton Arboretum, started the Rails to Trails movement, uh, but incredible stuff. Uh, there's also some books, um, I forget the gentleman's name, but one's called Forest Forensics. Um, and it's a great book so that a kid walking through the forest can look at things and start reading the landscape. Oh, this used to be a farmer's field. Or, oh, they drove on that side versus this side. So there's some really interesting books that way. Um, there's also a lot of things um, for like, like uh, kindergarten to third grade, but I don't have the titles in my head, uh, but I could probably look up and, and get you some stuff. Um, also, talk to your school, volunteer at your school, learn about Project Learning Tree, and they have curricula that's already set up to fit in the New Jersey academic curriculum. So you could teach this stuff in grade schools, age appropriate, it's already been all worked out. So think about Project Learning Tree and that may be a really good way to get started in that. Okay, well, I think you got to all the questions except some really specific things. So I'll let people email you directly, but I really appreciate your time. Thank you everyone for joining us on our last but not least webinar for this spring. Um, and we really appreciate Dr. Jason Grabowski for joining us tonight. Lots of great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to finish your talk, um, but- no, It's fun, it's fun. <laughs> Uh, but this is wonderful, and thank you everyone for filling out the poll, and again, we will be following up with you via email about, you know, what actions you've taken, what actions you intend to take uh, based on the recommendations for things you can do at home, Earth Day every day, uh, so thank you for joining us, and we will look forward to our fall series and we hope that you take part in this week's Arbor Day and remember that uh, the best time to plant a tree is yesterday. <laughs> um, so you go. So, yeah, yeah, but, um, but thank you. And I'm gonna stop the recording. Uh, let's see, how do I stop the recording? Here we go. <laughs>